Well, thank you. It's uh, good to be here this morning. Um, the passage in the Bible we're going to look at is in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. It's the passage that was read at the beginning of our worship. Uh, if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to Mark chapter 2 because we're going to be looking at things as, in the text as we go along. Uh, this is the account of Jesus healing a paralyzed man. It's an interesting episode in Jesus' ministry because it shows us three things. Um, one relates to our response to Jesus, our faith, and how we may exercise it. And two relate to Jesus himself, his authority uh, and his priority. Well, first, some background. Let me read verses 1 and 2 again. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. Uh, he returned to Capernaum. Uh, where is Capernaum? And what's this about returning? Uh, well, Capernaum is a, a small town on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. But if we're reading Mark, uh, Capernaum is a special place. I mean, we're only at the beginning of this passage we've read. This is only the beginning of the second chapter. If you go back to the beginning of Mark, chapter 1, you find that uh, Mark spends just a few verses telling about the period before Jesus' public ministry. He talks about John the Baptist, Jesus' baptism, Jesus' temptation. And then halfway through that chapter, he launches into Jesus' public ministry. And we read this. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And then uh, Jesus, the first thing Mark tells us, he goes and he calls four fishermen, Peter and his brother Andrew, James and his brother John. And this is just outside the town of Capernaum. Because immediately after Jesus calls those four fishermen, uh, they go into the town of Capernaum, and there they go to Peter and Andrew's house, and they're staying in that house. And when the Sabbath day comes, Jesus goes to the, the synagogue where they, where they gather to worship, and there, uh, in a very uh, dramatic way, he, he delivers a man who has been uh, bound by demons. And then after the service, they go back to uh, Peter and Andrew's house, and Peter's mother-in-law is sick, and Jesus heals her. And then when the evening comes, and, and the Sabbath restrictions uh, uh, go away, crowds gather around and into that house, and Jesus is, is healing many, many people. And all that's happening in this town of Capernaum. But then the next morning, Jesus moves on. And we read in Mark 139, he went through all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. But now, in the passage we just read, Jesus is back. And you see it says, it was reported he was at home. That's got to be Peter and Andrew's house. And there into that same house, that the people crowd around again. And it says, he was preaching the word to them. We're now on to the, the three main things that this passage shows us. First, Mark gives us a picture of faith. I'm going to read uh, verses 3 to 5 again. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Sons, your sins are forgiven. Um, Jesus saw their faith. 
what was Jesus seeing? Well, one thing he saw is that these men believed specific things. I mean, faith is not just a, a, an intrinsic personality trait, uh, like you either have it or you don't. I mean, we sometimes hear somebody say something like, uh, I wish I had her faith. Um, you know, it's kind of like, I wish I had her cheerful disposition, or I, I wish I had her creativity. Um, no, faith is an option for anyone. It's a matter of seeing and hearing something and latching on to it. So what have these men latched on to? Well, for sure, that Jesus could heal the paralyzed man. I mean, this was Capernaum. They had seen demons cast out. They had seen people healed. And they had heard reports coming in later from all around Galilee of, uh, of people being healed. And uh, they came because they believed that their friend could be healed. But it was more than that. They must have been mindful of Jesus' total message. I mean, there in the house at that moment, he was preaching the word to them. They must have known that Jesus' healing and casting out of demons was part of something bigger. Well, back in uh, chapter 1, we read what that bigger thing was. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. I mean, this was the time of God fulfilling all his promises to Israel. It was a time of God breaking into the world, uh, disrupting the normal flow of things, uh, a time when he was establishing his reign, uh, putting things right, destroying evil, uh, delivering the oppressed, rescuing the humble poor. It was a time to repent and a time to believe this good news. So when Jesus sees the paralytic and his friends, he's seen people who are getting on board with that message. Um, you want greater faith? Well, open your eyes to Jesus' ministry, or Jesus' message. Uh, see who he is. Uh, know what he says. But another thing that Jesus saw was persistent, active pursuit. I mean, they removed the roof above him. And that's not quite as wild an action as it would be today, tearing the roof off of somebody's house. Uh, but it was, I mean, I guess the, the archaeologists say it's a flat roof and the way it was constructed, it was possible to remove some of the roofing and, you know, without totally destroying everything. But it's not exactly normal practice either. Um, maybe these men thought, this is a special time. The kingdom of God is near. Jesus is breaking all the rules. So it's okay for us to take some special action, too. Um, and we lived in the 1980s in Algeria. And toward the end of the first year that we spent in Algeria, it was the summer of 1982. And all during that springtime and leading up, something was happening in the country that we weren't paying much attention to, and that was that Algeria was getting into the World Cup. They got into the football, the, the soccer World Cup for the first time in their history. And that was a big deal. And being Americans and not being too tuned in to football and World Cup, some of this just passed us by, I guess. But 
the very first game, they were up against West Germany, defending champions. And uh, we were at home, and a couple of young guys, some friends of ours came by. Uh, maybe they thought we had a television or something. I don't know. We didn't. Anyhow, we wound up. They said, we've got we've to uh, hear the World Cup. We turned on the radio, and, and we're listening. And Algeria beat West Germany 3-1. to one. And we went out into the streets after that. And it was pandemonium. It was, the streets were just, I mean, this was a, I mean, uh, not only just the football, I mean, this was a little colonial, ex-colonial Algeria, never quite making it. Uh, Europe over there, all the power and civilization and wealth and technology. And to beat them, to beat West Germany in that game, uh, the, the intersections just clogged with, with uh, cars and people, and the policemen just totally gave up. You know, they were joining in, gave up directing traffic. There were women, and in this society, this just didn't happen, sitting on the hoods of cars, waving flags. Um, it wasn't normal behavior. It was a special time. Well, you know, people sometimes want something. Um, you know, a, a, a job application. They're going for a job or, or some business deal they'd like to see go through or, or maybe courting. And you hear about people who take bold, aggressive steps. You know, they just go right up to the person and say what they want and they won't refuse to take no for an answer. Um, actually, that kind of thing is hard to get right. You know, sometimes you take a laid-back approach and later wonder, well, if I'd been a little more aggressive, maybe I would have got it. Uh, other times, you're, you're bold and later you wonder, well, uh, maybe I overstepped. Well, boldness worked for the paralytic and his friends. And yeah, that makes sense, because when Jesus talked about prayer, he used strong, active words, ask, seek, knock. Okay, we're talking about faith. And bold, active pursuit is not the only form of true faith. I remember hearing a, a, a woman give her testimony once, and she told how you know, she kind of went to church, sort of a formal, nominal believer, I guess, and in, in a church in England. And one day she was just sitting there, like she had for many times in the past, and they were reading the the the, the communion service. And as as in the middle of that, somehow suddenly it was just like a light went on and the words suddenly hit her and, and she suddenly just knew that that Christ had died for her sins and, and that and that she was she belonged to him. Um, well not everybody has an experience like that. Faith is also when you simply know you have a need have at least some reason to think Jesus can help you and just go for it. And don't let yourself be easily put off. I mean, there's a blind man, and we read about it in Mark chapter 9, who, um, beside the road, he's calling out, Jesus, son of David, help me, save me. And people told him to be quiet, don't, don't bother the master. He just shouts louder, Jesus, son of David, he gets healed. Well, that's what Jesus sees in these men. There's something else he sees. Look at verse 5. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. That's a singular you. In Greek, there is a singular you. He's just talking to the paralyzed man. Your sins are forgiven. Now, Jesus, it says, if Jesus saw their faith, you expect him to say to the whole group, your sins are forgiven. 
Or if Jesus just pronounces forgiveness to the paralytic, you expect Mark to tell us he saw his faith. What's going on here? Well, it's not that the friends are believing for the paralyzed man as if he doesn't have to believe. But it's not that the paralyzed man is believing in isolation. Um, you want to receive God's forgiveness and not sure your faith is strong enough? Well, maybe get a pastor or a few friends to go to Jesus with you. When you see a friend struggling at the point of trusting Christ, well, offer to go to Jesus with them. Um, I mean, I think something like that often happens when uh, pastors or elders um, pray with someone at the moment they're struggling to, to reach out to God in faith. And maybe we should do that a lot more often to, to have a, a, a culture, a way of doing things where, where groups of uh, Christian friends are able to, um, to gather around and come together and, and pray with, with someone who's struggling to reach out with God or where people who are kind of uh, in that just struggling area can, can go and, and find friends who gather with them and come to God. Well, that's the picture of faith we've got. Uh, know something about Jesus and latch on to it. Put obstacles and uncertainties away and go for it. And get some friends to go to Jesus with you. But there's a second thing. Mark shows us Jesus' priority. Verse 5. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. And this man is paralyzed. It's a physical problem. He and his friends come with faith. And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. That's Jesus' priority. What, what sin? I mean, is this man a, a, an obvious sinner like some of the prostitutes and tax collectors that Jesus would hang around with? Doesn't say that. Or did he have some hidden sin that led to his being punished with paralysis? No hint of that in the text. In fact, in the Gospel of John, there was a case where there was a man born blind and disciples asked, who sinned? And, and Jesus said, no one. There's no indication of anything remarkable about this man as far as his need for forgiveness. Spiritually, morally, in terms of behavior, just a normal person. And Jesus looks at this normal person and judges forgiveness of sins to be his number one need. And whose priority is this? Well, it's not the paralytics. No indication he felt burdened by sin. Not his friends. No clue that they thought the paralytic had a sin problem. It's Jesus' priority. And so let's think about ourselves. I don't know whether you feel a burning need to be forgiven. It's not that important whether you do or not. Here's what's important. That Jesus Christ God's Son sent into the world for our salvation sees your need of forgiveness to be a burning priority. And what is forgiveness? 
to me it's a big, big topic. Uh, just a couple of points. First, let me compare forgiveness with cleansing. I mean, I say that because just the passage before this is about Jesus cleansing a leper. And the man comes to him and says, um, you can make me clean. And Jesus looks at him and says, I will be clean. And the thing with leprosy, it wasn't just a physical uh, sickness. It, in, in, uh, according to the Old Testament law, it made a person religiously, ceremonially, unclean, unfit somehow, and they had to be, they're kind of like outcasts. And cleansing throughout scripture is a, is a term and a word that is used for, for getting right with God and, and getting our lives taken care of. Uh, wash me, David said, after he had sinned, wash me and I will be whiter than snow. So to talk about being forgiven and being cleansed from sin, it's, it's two different ways of of saying the same thing, the same reality. But the image of cleansing, um, it kind of puts the focus on us. Um, you know, whether we're a good, clean person or a dirty, despicable person. Uh, forgiveness is relational. You hurt someone. I mean, maybe somebody close to you, maybe somebody you hardly know, maybe something big, maybe something small, something you said, or something you did. But another person is affected. A relationship is damaged. And you've got to go to them and receive their forgiveness. Forgiveness is relational, uh, can also be judicial. When you owe a debt, can't pay it, you need somehow to get that debt forgiven. You commit a crime, you're going to prison, you need somehow to get pardoned. I mean, if being cleansed puts the focus on you, being forgiven puts the focus on God. And another thing about forgiveness, the Bible speaks both of a definitive and an ongoing forgiveness. I mean, Peter on the day of Pentecost, he's preaching to a big crowd of people who don't know Jesus, and, and at the end he says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the, for, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. That is the a definitive being forgiven and becoming children of God. Um, I think for the paralytic, that's what it was. It was, it was a definitive and life-changing experience of forgiveness. But Jesus also taught us to pray every day, forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. I mean, if you've never had your debts canceled. Never received God's pardon for your violation of his holy law. Then that's Jesus' number one priority for you. And I know that most of you uh, belong to Jesus and have received that definitive forgiveness of your sins. But it's still a priority of Jesus for you to receive his ongoing forgiveness for the things that you know that have come into your behavior day by day. It's relational. It's something he cares about. And it's interesting. In Luke's account of Jesus' resurrection appearances, he tells us, and he's the only gospel writer that tells us this, he tells us that Jesus appeared first before the other disciples to Peter. And he appeared to him alone. Now, when Jesus appeared to his disciples, it was Jesus who, 
who decided when and where to do that. In other words, this was Jesus' priority. And Luke doesn't tell us, he tells us that happened. He doesn't tell us a word of, of what was said between Jesus and Peter. Just that Jesus appeared to Peter first and alone. He made it a priority. Now, we know from the Bible what happened leading up to that meeting. We know what, what came before. Uh, Peter, Peter denied Jesus. And we know what happened after that meeting, that Peter went on to be the bold leader of the, uh, of the, of the church. Uh, but the meeting itself, I mean, it's like, it's like as if Jesus and Peter are in a room with the door closed. And we don't know what is said. But we know that meeting has to happen. And we know that when Peter comes out of that room, he knows he is forgiven. Well, a final thing that uh, we see in this passage, Mark shows us Jesus' authority. Look at verses 6 and 7. Now, some scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And how can Jesus say to this man, your sins are forgiven? Who does he think he is? He doesn't have the authority to tell that man his sins are forgiven. So Jesus has told this man his sins are forgiven, but maybe this isn't going to work out after all. Because the scribes have a point. It takes authority to forgive sins. Authority is not just raw power. It's a moral and legal right. I mean, if John insults Jim, and I go to John and say, I forgive you, what does that mean? I don't have any right to forgive John for what he did to Jim. Um, or if Mary commits tax fraud, and I go to her and say, Mary, I forgive you. It's not me that's got the right to do that. She's committed a crime against the state. Who am I? So forgiving sins demands authority. And Jesus proves he has it. Maybe read verses 8 and following. And immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Now Jesus' question, which is easier? Um, it's not a deep theological question. I mean, this is not theology class. It would make a great question for theology class. I mean, which is easier? For, for God to heal someone or for God to forgive their sins. Um, but this is a on-the-spot practical question. It's to help those scribes and everybody else who's, who's around uh, see something. I mean, not the wording. The question is, which is easier to say 
to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk. Point is, it's easy enough to say your sins are forgiven. Because no one can really prove that you're wrong. But say, rise, take up your bed, and walk, in about 10 seconds, everyone in the room is going to know whether your words have weight or not. Jesus asked this question because he's about to prove he has authority. Look at verse 10. But in order that you may know that the Son of Man does have authority on earth to forgive sins, he says to the paralytic, rise, get up and walk. I need to talk about the foundations of Jesus' authority. I mean, that paralytic knew his sins were forgiven. Never mind what the scribe said. He knew that Jesus had authority. He felt it. He rose. He picked up his bed. He went out on his own power. And every step he took, he knew. Uh, he didn't know everything we know about Jesus. But he knew he was right with God. Tension was erased. The debts were canceled. The sentence was lifted. The cloud dispersed. We need to know that Jesus has authority to forgive our sins. We need to know it to the point of feeling it. That if he says our sins are forgiven, it is indeed true. And the way for us to do that is to look at the foundations of Jesus' authority. We live on the west side of San Francisco. Sandy soil. And I don't get too worked up about this, but um, you know there are these earthquake fears. I don't know if that touches you in Cupertino. But, you know, a couple times a year there'll be some feature in the newspaper with maps and diagrams and you know, the, when the big one is coming and what it's going to do to this neighborhood and that neighborhood and, you know, and, um, so now and then I like to go down into the garage of our house. It's kind of a garage come basement in the main living area is up above on the, the second level. I like to go down. And there are five big redwood beams, vertical. And these big redwood beams connecting them up. And I remember when we first got the house, we got an inspector to come and tell us what was right and wrong about the house. And I walked around with him, and he said, wow, those are really big beams. And he showed me the studs along the side of the house. They're not these little two-by-fours. They're, they're three-by-fours, thick, solid redwood, and nicely. Sp and, and he said, this is a solid house. And you know, sometimes I like to go and pass my hands over those thick beams. and and. Once, after reading one of those articles, I, I got a neighbor who's a contractor to come, and he went around and he put these big bolts, bolting the frame into the concrete foundation, and he, and he put some steel brackets where those beams connect up um, so they wouldn't shift when the earthquake, when the big one comes. And you know, now and then I like to go down and look at those. It gives me some comfort. I mean, I hope it'll be okay. I mean, you could always do a little more. But if my house were Jesus' word of forgiveness, it would have steel beams, iron walls, and be sitting on bedrock a mile deep. And that's something we need to look at now and then. Uh, so what are the foundations of Jesus' authority? Well, first of all, 
who he is. I mean, the scribes say, who can forgive sins but God alone? Have you ever been through the process of trying to get something approved where several steps are involved, you know, a job offer or a, a loan application, and it's got to work its way up the organizational chain uh, and, and it takes a few weeks. And it's good to hear encouraging reports along the way. But until it gets to the top and the final authority, you're never sure. But Jesus is the Son of God. When it comes to forgiving or judging our sins, there is no higher level to which the decision must go for approval. Jesus Christ, the eternal Word who took on flesh, is one with the God of Israel. He is our creator. Our relationship with him is the one ultimate and inescapable relationship. I mean, if every other relationship in your life falls apart, this is the one that counts. And if Jesus tells us our sins are forgiven, we are absolutely okay. And he is the one true lawgiver. It's his right to give the law. And the law is a reflection of his own eternal character. It's not above him, something he needs to obey. It's not just arbitrary, something he can change this way or that. It's him. And all violations are ultimately against him and him alone. I mean, yes, we need to seek forgiveness from people we've offended, but in the end, there's just one pardoning voice that counts. But there's a second foundation to Jesus' authority, and that's what he did for us. Now, Jesus' first visit to Capernaum in Mark chapter 1, uh, I mentioned there was this, uh, he, he he cast demons out of a man. And, and if you were to read that passage, it, it highlights Jesus' authority. I mean, the demons are screaming all kinds of crazy things, and Jesus just authoritatively says, um, it says he rebuked him, saying, be silent, come out of him, and they go. And then we read, the people say, what is this? A new teaching with authority. Now, demons are agents of Satan. What gave Jesus authority over them? I mean, was it just the bare fact that he was the Son of God? Well, the thing is, with demons, they think they've got the right to be where they are. One that even God must respect. They appeal to God's own law. Satan and the demons do. And they use it as a weapon against us. But there are two things Jesus did to silence those law-spouting demons. And when I say law-spouting, I mean they say, look, the wages of sin is death. You sin, you deserve to die. But two things Jesus did to silence them. That gave him authority over them. One was at the very beginning of Mark, one at the very end. Beginning of Mark, Jesus met Satan in the wilderness. He was tempted. He, he replayed Adam. He replayed what we go through when we're tempted and sin, but he stood in our place and he did not sin. He defeated Satan on our behalf. And at the very end of the Gospel of Mark, when Jesus is on the cross, there's uh, one of the, you know, Mark in some ways is the simplest of the Gospel writers, a little crude and simple, not very sophisticated, but he says things that are, uh, go so deeply to the heart of what God did through Jesus Christ. Jesus on the cross cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And somehow, 
at that moment in Christ's death, he took upon himself the fullest punishment of our sin, not just a physical death, but somehow tasted on our behalf that spiritual separation from God. So let me read, just in closing, Paul's take on this in Colossians. A few verses from Colossians chapter 2. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Christ, having forgiven all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside now, how did he set it aside? Did he just say, well, we'll just never mind that? No. Set it aside, nailing it to the cross. And then Paul says, through the cross, he disarmed the rulers and authorities, the demons, the, the accusing voice of Satan, totally disarmed, and put them to order, open shame, triumphing over them, in the cross. So, forgiving sins is Jesus' priority. And he has full authority to do that. All the pieces are in place. So be like that paralytic and his friends, and don't let any obstacle stop you. Go to Jesus in faith. Let's pray. Lord, we read in your word who you are, what your desire is, and we, uh, this applies to us, wherever we are in our lives. Um, Lord, I pray that you would through your spirit, uh, convict us, convince us, draw us to Jesus, uh, that we might stretch out in faith and receive the forgiveness that you tell us we need. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.